Thank you for joining us for our second service. Um, so, <clears throat> and some of us may not be here last week, sure, but after the sermon last week, and after the service, um, for those of us that were here first, people came to me after service, and I was calling me, you know, after everything that we said oh, from this place, from this authoritative point. After everything that we said, people came and started calling, ah, emoji, oh, emoji, man of God. Ha, haba. That was not that was not the worst of it all. So I went to Ikoi GC on Thursday. <laughs> Ikoi, but I didn't laugh. Guilty people. <laughs> so I went to Ikoi GC on Sunday, uh, on Thursday rather. So I normally go after the, towards the end of the GC because I'm in Maryland GC. That's one that I lead. But I go for um, Ikoi GC. Um, people, some people think I come to pick Sarah. But me, I know what I come for. It's the jollof rice. <laughs> it's the jollof rice and the chicken that I go for. And God bless all the people that have provided it and the fair and the chef that have prepared it. I actually think that they should call that jollof rice J O G instead of calling me M O G. Call jollof rice J O G. Jollof rice of God. Call that jollof rice is fantastic. If you are around Eco East side and you are supposed to go for Eco East side, you are not going. You are missing. I mean, you'll be calling Bembo Jopa now, you'll not go for, go for GC. Go on GOG. Um, so after the GC now, okay, me now saw me, okay, me now say, ah, daddy wa, ah. Oh, daddy is calling somebody daddy. <laughs> oh, yesterday, Saturday, I called uh, Samuzis. Samuzis, before I could even say anything, just said, Pastor Dami. I say, oh my goodness. So, if... Grandpa, hear me? Because that's how we'll be doing this now. <laughs> you give me one, I'll give you two steps. I, uh, Grandpa, hear me? And Senior Reverend Moses can do that to me. Um, that means I will have to recap last week's sermon. <laughs> I will not repreach it. That will, that will, we will not have the time. So I will recap the sermon. So for those that join us for the first time, and those that were not around last week, we talked about the faithful follower. And that's the first sermon in, our, in the fellowship part of the series. So we said that faithful followers, to be a faithful follower is not by calling your leaders' names. We said that faithful followers are those that remember their leaders, that consider their leaders, that imitate their leaders, that obey and submit to their leaders, that pray for their leaders. That's what it means to be a faithful follower. Okay? Amen to that? Amen. Thank you. Um, but before that sermon, you know, we did leadership for like three weeks. So we started leadership, and we said that you see, the leaders that should be followed are those leaders that are responsible, are those leaders that are servant leaders, those leaders that are moral leaders. So we'll continue today from where we stopped last week. Um, as anybody, how many of us saw King of Boys, the movie? Ah, it's a lot of people on point. Um, or you may not have seen it yet. I'm also because it's on Netflix now. Yeah. I wish some people said on Netflix, have you? Okay. Um, so if you've not seen it, try to watch it. It is one of the better movies out of Nollywood this time. You know, in terms of the story, in terms of technicality, they tried. You know, the woman tried well. So it is not one of those movies where they just have these endless party scenes. Like you don't even know what's happening. They're just grooving and grooving for like 10 minutes. And you don't see how it connects to the plot. If you leave the, if you leave where they're watching and you come back, it is you that be explaining the movie to them. <laughs> Should be the waters. So the woman did this. Say yes. Ah, how do you know? Sir? I've seen it before. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's not because in this particular movie, there was a suicide in this movie. So in this movie, they did this well. You know, normal suicide in old Hollywood, the person will shoot himself in the head and then will not drop the gun on the table. <laughs> so the guy shot himself in the head and the gun fell. So it's a good movie. You guys should go and check it out. <laughs> the main character in this movie is Shola Shobowale, right? Um, and your ladder was her name in the movie. So this is action woman that was in wedding party. If you watch wedding party, the woman action. The movie is about a flawed businesswoman and philanthropist that wanted to make it big in politics. So she had met helped many people in power, both powerful people, even powerless people on the streets. Yes, I'm spo- this is the spoiler. And why you not watch it in the theaters? <laughs> or you know what this is September 2020 was on Netflix. Um, so she wanted to make it big in politics. So her time had not come. But all the people that helped her 
then I turned my back, back against her. He didn't want to help her. There was nobody for her to look up to, nobody for her to trust. So this struggle for power, trying to also, it took almost everything from her. Like it took her children from her. She lost her children. She lost her business. She lost money. She lost power. Towards the end of the movie, you find her like very one very chilling scene. Towards the end of the movie, you find her locked in a cell, like tying this black wrapper and his black hair tie. You know, just one single bed like this. The room just empty, just her. And she's losing her mind. She's just recounting all her losses. You know, why did I make this decision? You know. There was nobody else that came to help her, both the good people and the bad people that she helped. You know, she was sure that she would die. That's how gory that scene was sure the way you see it. She was even having all these hallucinations. Then a thug came in. A thug. Thug name is Makanaki. So the guy walked in with his drama, you know, just coming in and they were just playing this, those kind of sounds. And the guy came in. So this thug had now, this thug, she had helped this thug in the past. But now this thug was now working for a political rival of ours. So the guy came and showed up because they bribed the police, they've done all that. And after they had this very, very, this kind of conversation, we'll talk about it later, then the guy just walked away. They already put foil everywhere. And then the guy just threw, the guy just threw up bounds, just threw his cigarette bound and the old place caught fire, you know, and left the woman to die. He left Shola Shabali to be consumed in the flames and the fumes. Um, sometimes, <coughs> Responsible moral servant leaders today are in a similar position. They are consumed by the demands and expectations of their calling and work. Most times it's part of their job. They can't change it much. They can't do anything about it. That's part of their calling. So we say yes, and they should depend on the person that called them now. It does depend on God. It's not God that called them. But our text today shows us that discouraged leaders need courageous followers. So the title of today's sermon is The Courageous Follower. So how? How do we, what's the portrait? How do we paint this portrait of a courageous follower? Two ways. The courageous follower refreshes their leader. The second way is the courageous follower is not ashamed of their leader. The first, refreshes their leader. You find it in the verse, uh, in verse 16. It said that, may God grant mercy to the house of Bonissi for us, who has refreshed me. You see, this text it's part of the book of Timothy. And it was written by, written by, um, by Paul to his son, Timothy, son in the faith. You see, Paul had been in prison after like 30 years of doing ministry, of doing this good work. So it's not like he had stopped doing ministry work. Because oh. this letter itself is evidence that the guy had not stopped. Even from prison, was still working. Locked up in a prison. And this was a time when the particular guy that was in charge of Rome, that time was called Emperor Nero. The guy's a bad guy. Like people who were so terrible. His dread filled hearts and minds so much that people were even scared to mention his name on the streets. He was a very bad guy. He had, he had a no-nonsense approach towards courts, all these people calling themselves Christians, the way, all kinds of religious groups. No nonsense. Takes you to jail, kills you. So this Paul, eh, in this prison, he felt like, because he had come to this place too, where he felt like he was going to die. Because commentators tell us that this was probably the last letter that Paul wrote in his ministry. So he felt, he felt like he was coming close to his end. He showed that he was going to die. But Paul was a strong man. In Corinthians, one of his earlier letters, he had written that, you see, I have labored more abundantly than you all, than all the apostles. This was not even when he was a Christian. Even before he was a Christian, Paul was a very, very strong guy. Paul would go this distance, go and get um, Christians. Then he would take their clothes, then he would go this distance, and then go and put them in prison. He would come back again. He was doing that back and forth. He was on that, one of those trips that the Lord met him on Damascus. So this Paul labored so much that Bible recorded in Acts that Paul had preached the gospel to everyone in Asia. Although the Asia there does not refer to Asia as we see today. It's Asia Minor in a couple of cities, but it was still something. They had preached the gospel to everyone there. And the Bible says that everyone in the whole of Asia had heard the gospel because of Paul's work. But now see what it says here in verse 15. It says, everyone in the province of Asia has deserted me. Deserted here means to turn away. He's saying, you see, the people that I've preached to, the people that I've cared for, even people that have believed in the gospel through my ministry, see, they've deserted them. They've turned away from me. You know, it does not mean like the old people. You know, when Paul uses superlatives at times, he's speaking of, you see, people of all manners of people, like um, lawyers, like bankers, like settlers, all kinds of people in all kinds of people have deserted me. 
Because later you even see that there are still some people that were Onesiphorus or at least was with him. Other people were still. He was not saying totality of people. He was speaking to people just to show that so many people had deserted him. He says, Timothy, you know, you've heard that everyone in the province of Asia has deserted me. So this was a big deal. You see, our leaders today may not be in prison or our leaders today may not experience such great suffering, but they go through pain. Our leaders are meant to be more mature than us. They're supposed to be examples. They're supposed to be strong, more en enduring. But they're still human. They're still men. They're still women. They go through stuff. You know, leaders, they go through stuff that make them question God's goodness, that make them question God's sovereignty over their lives, over their ministry. Did they re did you recall me? They struggle to practice what they preach to us. The very same things they declare from here, they find it hard to practice sometimes. You see, leaders who, maybe for a new church planter, for instance, who plant a church you know, after a few years, and the church is not blossoming the way he has envisioned it, the way he had his strategy and plan. But then he sees his neighboring pastor, he sees his friend pastor, who planted around the same time, even later than him, flourishing. And then he, doesn't, he, doesn't, he doesn't understand why he's looked this way. He's struggling with this in his heart, you know, unknown to the congregation, unknown to others. It pains him. Sometimes he even envies the pastor. He envies, he sometimes even not, he has odd feelings towards him, but, but he goes ahead on Twitter and on Instagram to congratulate them. You know, I learned that you guys are now growing and blossoming. He sends a message on Facebook. You know, a leader of a GC or a gospel community, for instance, they are working. Many of them work in very, very serious industries. Like, I take a lot of their time. And so they have to spend a lot of time working, and they still have to spend time dedicated to shepherding the GC. And they're wondering, I can't leave my work, very important. But then I also have to give a lot of time to GC. How do I so they struggle with this? What is my calling? What should I do? They have these struggles that keeps them awake at night. Or a pastor counseling a couple who's married has been struggling for like two years. He's seen, he's hoping that they will heal, he's hoping that they will come together, he's hoping that not to happen. And then after two years, he ends in divorce. How do you think the leader feels? How do you do, can you imagine the pain that they are going through? They preach two services on Sunday, preach, preaches theology day, preaches during the week, and then on Mondays, for many days, if you've spoken with them, church leaders, for instance, you see, Mondays are usually the day they feel like quitting. They, just, they, just, they feel like going on holiday. They imagine this, this sweet holiday where they'll go with their wife and their kids. You know, they imagine the place they'll go, how relaxed they'll be, the boring meetings that they would, um, they would miss, all those disturbing, disturbing church members that will not disturb them for this holiday. They just imagine because they can't even find the time to take away from their schedule. Some of them have struggled with air conditions and issues, you know. I remember some weeks ago, you know, I was to call the pastor very dear to me, who was responsible for bringing, one of the people who was responsible for bringing him up, you know, in church, in former church, I think, where I grew up. You know, everything I did up until I was in school, he knew, encouraged me, always advising me. And I was to call him to tell him, oh, that my wife and I are not expecting. But I didn't know how to put it to him. Because this very same pastor had been struggling to find, to get the fruit of him for like 16 years. This is the pastor who had prayed for people who were barren, barren. This is the pastor who had advised people to go for fertility clinics. This is the pastor who has all kinds of children, but he's not able to conceive his own in his own family. They struggle. They have issues. So what do we do to them? Do we leave them? Do we turn away from them? Or like this text is saying, do we desert them? You see, everyone in the province of Asia deserted me. See, it's as if they were chatting. Imagine that. Imagine if... Um, Paul and Timothy they were chatting on WhatsApp. So after he says that everyone in the province of Asia deserted me, so you know, Timothy now asks, okay, ah, wow, wow. So daddy, you know, Timothy calls, he's like, well, he's his father. So he's allowed, that kind of stuff. He's the father in the Lord. So he says, ah, so daddy, um, so ah, fragilous and uh, emogenous. Hope they are not overwhelmed though, because at least, I hope they, are, hope they are still taking care of you well. And then Paul will now reply. And I say, which five? Emmy what? They too have left me. Long ago, they've left me. You see, you see, you see everyone in the province of Asia has left me, including Phygelos and Emogenes. So I'll be calling them Phi and Emi because that one is very, yeah, it's very long and I can't mispronounce it. So you see, Phi and Emi must have been people that Paul had poured his life out into. It must be people that Paul had greatly invested in. Well, why would he mention them? He said Phygelos and Emogenes. You see, these are, not, these are not the kind of courageous followers that we're trying to portray. You see, these are my people who the Jesus leader or the leader in church or 
um, the boss. Once I've cared for so much, I've done everything for your improvement, for your growth, and all that, you know, counsel you, visited you, call. and the person will come at the end of the day and say, they don't care for me in that church. They don't care. I don't, I don't, they, don't, they, don't, they don't know what care is like. They don't understand care in that church. They don't, they don't, actually, they don't understand care. And then the very church that this leader, this moral, responsible servant leader, like the, the false gospel teachings that this church uh, he has been taking down and trying to take down, and then this same person who says they've not cared for it will now go ahead and go and join that prosperity gospel church. How do you think it feels to these leaders? Commentators said that they think that, you see, this deserting in pain, yes, it's about deserting, deserting leaders and deserting poor in pain, but it's also when people desert you because because of some things they don't like, or some things that you say they don't like. You know, it's easy for people to say, ride on, pastor, ride on. When you're preaching stuff that is nice, something that's appealing to them, ride on, preach it. Rema. <laughs> they stand up and rema. And catch it, they don't want to let it go. Glory. Glory. Pastor. Pastor. <laughs> like this whole series, this whole series, like, is for me. I don't know, every time the word comes, it just hits me. Hits me every time. Only me, they say, I've been, oh, era, era. Um, I've been in small groups, so I've, not, I've been a Christian for a long time. I can't even, no, 16 to 20 years, I can't really say a particular day when I give up. I've been in small groups, but you, the way you lead the GC, I don't know. They're able to do this when the things appeal to them. You see, but when the leader says something that scratches them a bit, that inconveniences them a bit, or when it makes one management sleep, just one mistake, one decision, Wrong decision. They point to that. And they desert the leader. They desert the church. They desert the group. And then you will not have to beg them for weeks. You have to beg them for months to come back to church. You see, in the king of boys, when Makanaki got to the cell, see what Shalashu Boyle did. Shalashu Boyle looked at him. He said, ah, I've been waiting for you. You've not come. And she was dispirited, discouraged. She was downcast. So she looked at him and said, ah, can you give me a knife? Give me a knife. Give me a gun. Let me kill myself. Let me end this thing. Let me put an end to it. And then see how Makanaki responded. The guy said, <laughs> the guy laughed in his very, 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 very wicked laughter. He laughed and looked at her. And he said in Yoruba, Yoruba is very sweet, and I will translate English. He said, he, Kuma. Ah, I forgot, you know. Ah. <laughs> oh, my God. He said one, he said two, then I said, Kuma, 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 Jerora, Kuma, Kuma, Jerora, Luboshin, Shemini, that you should be wailing, you should be weeping, you should be, you should be in agony. That is how I want you to be. You see, when we do this, when we desert our leaders in all of these circumstances, do we not add to their, their aches of feeling like a leader some days, and then some days they feel like nobody. This is something that's already there. Some days they feel like they're a friend of everybody. And some days they feel like strangers. Some days they feel like everybody knows them. 100 days they feel unknown. They feel so alone. Do we not add to what the struggles and the pain that they already have? We desert them like Paul in prison. We leave them to be consumed. And so what do they need? What they need is refreshment. That's what Paul says. They need refreshment. You see, Paul says in that 16, he says that in that 16, he says, you see, may the Lord grant mercy to Onesiphorus. We're going to call him one day, one Nesiphorus, and I'll tell you why. Because the meaning of Onesiphorus is bringer of prophets. So now evil men are the ones that are really into prophets. So, and that Onesiphorus is very long. So I'll just call him one day. So he said, he said, may the Lord grant mercy to the household of Onesiphorus, to the household of one day. Why? He said, because he has refreshed me. Why? What, what does this guy do? You see, this guy will bring food to Paul in prison. He will bring drinks to Paul in prison. This guy will perhaps bring parchments for Paul to write upon, to write his letters on. Anything that Paul needed in prison, one day would have brought to Paul. Because many of these prisons at that time were horrible. They were infested with all manners of stuff. People actually committed suicide because they were in these prisons. It was that bad. History shows us. And like I mentioned last week, <clears throat> for many leaders, the weight of leadership in church, as we've seen in recent times, 
has been so hard on some pastors, has been so hard on some leaders, that they've experienced anxiety, that they've experienced depression, that they've experienced mental illness to the point of taking their own lives, of committing suicide. You see, when Paul said that, when Paul said that one day has refreshed me, he's saying, he's not just saying he brings drinks to me, he brings food to me, he brings what I need to me. He's also saying that one day was there for me. He said, the guy often refreshed me. So he didn't, it wasn't a one-time gift, it wasn't a one-time visit. He said he often refreshed me. He was always there for Paul. Courageous followers are often there for their leaders. Courageous followers are genuinely there for their leaders. And some will say, how will I know? Like, how will I be asking them? You know, leaders are not always open. They don't go open. They're not, you know, you don't, they don't keep to themselves. They have a lot of people around them. How do I? See verse 17. See what Paul said about one day. He said that he searched hard for me until he found me. He searched hard for me until he found me. There were many prisons in Rome. There were many prisoners in the prisons. You see, it was so bad. It wasn't the very organized stuff. You can't go to the prison and then ask for the register and say you are looking for Paul, who is to bear Saul. Like, do you know him? Can I just, can you find him for me? You know, it wasn't that easy. So it wasn't easy for the guy. The guy searched earnestly. It's like picking up a total novice, foreigner at the airport. You know, maybe like a period of this when it's going to, when it's going to come. But you don't know the exact day and you don't know the exact hour and you just go to MM. One, and just waiting for the person. You see, for us to search hard and to find them, it would mean, you see, we would ask, we would pray, we would visit, we would send them texts, we would take them out, we would befriend their wives, we would befriend their, their children, we would invite them over, we would do whatever it takes. See, in verse 18, he says, for one day had helped me in many ways in Ephesus, in many ways. We we'll have to be imaginative, we we'll have to be creative. We we'll have to look for ways to refresh them. That is what courageous followers do. They don't sit back and wait for the opportunity to just come. You see, this is the kind of refreshment. You see, refreshment, Paul felt so refreshed that in verse 16, see what Paul prayed. Paul, Paul said a wish prayer. Paul said, I said it before, you see, may the Lord grant the household of an for us mercy. It's that kind of wish prayer, that kind of prayer that comes. It's not the one that comes when, you know those people that, if you travel by bus a lot, if you go to the park, and then your bus is almost full, you just see them come. They hug the Bible to the chest like this. We don't even know where that Bible is there, because it's usually wrapped with many, many things, different, different stickers. You don't know the church they're going. They just, it just, and just come, and just keep praying, and keep saying all kinds of stuff. Let's pray, let's pray, this vehicle, in Jesus' name, this vehicle, Jesus. And then when you finish, you'll say, bless me, refresh me. Refresh my ministry. Bless me. Bless me. You know, keep to the pray for you so that he can get most times. You know, that's not the kind of wish prayer Paul burst, burst out in here. You see, Paul was so refreshed. He's, he said, because he had refreshed me, may the Lord grant them mercy. You know that when you were in, when you were in school on campus, if you studied in Nigeria, you were, you know, times were hard, and it's time when all of your food finished like nothing. And you're wondering, what am I going to eat this afternoon, this night, and I have exam, I have test tomorrow. What am I going to eat? And then someone just comes, one of your relatives that lives around. And he has not come, he has not called you, he just came. He just called you and came and then brought you just full stuff, surplus. So much that you have to even share to your friends. You know how you feel? You just sit down. All of your friends will be praying for the person. All of you together, you just be praying. Ah, God, it will, it will be good for this woman's children. It will be good for them. God, God will, it will be good for them. See, that is the kind of refreshment that Paul felt. So you see, Courageous followers, they refresh their leaders, but they go further. And so some of us may be saying, ah, <laughs> I've never refreshed myself. Uh, is, is leadership not even easier than followership like this? I will not just be a leader, <laughs> follower. This thing is hard, though. One more step. We'll see how we can do it, despite the hardness of it. You see, the courageous follower is not ashamed of their leader. In verse 16, he said, One day was not ashamed of me, of my chains. One day was a courageous follower. He said, when he says chains here, he means one day was not ashamed of my imprisonment, was not ashamed of my sufferings. 
Sapphire and Emmy deserted Paul because they were ashamed of his chains, yes. Because to bear chains in that society was a mark of shame. So they deserted him because of a fear of being embarrassed, of being associated with Paul, of being humiliated because of him. But it means more. Because three times in this chapter 1, Paul talks about not being ashamed. Three times. In verse 8, he says this, So do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner. Rather, join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. See, in verse 11 to 12, listen, I want you to hear it. And of this gospel, I was appointed a herald and an apostle and a teacher. That is why I am suffering as I am. Yet, this is no cause for harm, for shame. If we quickly summarize what Paul is saying in these two verses, and then with this 16, where he says, I'm ashamed of my sin, change. See what Paul is saying. Paul is saying, see, I am suffering, and Paul is representing leaders. He says, I am suffering because of proclaiming the gospel, of trying to live out the gospel. Join with me in this suffering. Don't be ashamed. You see, one day in searching for Paul, see what you would have done. So one day you would have gone to all these prisons, all the prisons, so you are marked out the prison, maybe like five or seven Maybe in like 10 prisons. So you go to, you mark, I'll go to all the prisons. So when I've gone to one prison, and then we'll go and say, I'm looking for, um, I'm looking for a guy named Paul. Yes, he was used to be a soul. It's kind of like short, because the Bible told us the guy was, the history told us the guy was very short, so it was, of, was vertically challenged. Like short, that, uh, that has weak eye. There's something wrong because Bible, maybe if the pain that he had was about his eyes, so it's not like we say, maybe the guy has weak eye. His eye is not really seen well like that. Um, do, do you know him? Go on, ask person, I say, hmm. Is it that one that usually preach about Jesus every time? Like, when the guards come in the morning to serve food, you say, ah, Jesus, Jesus, he died and he resurrected. Or, like, every time we are on the assembly line, the guy's always preaching Jesus. So he has preached Jesus to almost everybody in this prison. Is it that one? He say, hey, yes, yes. He's short. Like, yes, he's short. Yeah, yes, yes, it's that one. Then the guy will say, are you his friend? Or are you his brother? Why are you looking for him? Like, you, you know, you don't want to be doing this, so. He said, no, he's my guy. That's the person I'm looking for. Because, because what this guy was doing was really risk. It was a big risk. He was, trying, he was risking ridicule. He was risking shame. Because they could, they could as well arrest him for being an accomplice. They could as well arrest him for being a sympathizer. But Paul thinks of it in a different way. See what Paul says in one of his other letters. Philipp, Philippians 1, verse 12 to 14. He says, now I want you to know brothers and sisters, that what happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. He said, many people are now preaching the gospel because of my chains, not out of fear, but with boldness. Leaders are motivated, leaders are energized to see that their followers are not embarrassed about what has brought them so much suffering and pain. They are refreshed. They are glad to see that what they are sacrificing so much for, their followers are also about it. That their followers can go on to do the same, proclaiming and living out the gospel out of boldness, not out of fear. It gladdens their heart. It gives them joy. So when we say that the courageous follower is not ashamed of, of, of the leader, of the leader's change, see what Paul is saying. Paul is saying, see, if you are ashamed of the gospel for which I live, for which I sacrificed my life for, you are ashamed of me too. Uh, Some of you say, eh, you know, many of us cannot really say that we are ashamed of the gospel. It's not something you can come to say. But this is how you look at it. If you are not proclaiming it as you should, if you're not leaving out the gospel as you should, then you can ask yourself, am I not ashamed of the gospel? You know, when you travel, like when you take all these, uh, if you take Molloy bus, like my two, that time, we you take Molloy bus. So, <clears throat> so, uh, don't put in that is proud now. Uh, I, I, I have to take it recent times. So, Molloy bus, um, so when you enter, what will happen is, this is already full. You just think, you would think it's a jolly, happy ride. I'm tired from work. Let me just go. I just want to chill, I want to sleep. As you mean, I just do like this. You don't hear, oh, my name is Atawewe. <laughs> this, my name is not Atawewe. It's because of this thing I'm selling. This thing is Atawewe. You see, you have back pain. You have neck pain. You have head pain. You have HIV. 
you have mental illness, or your leader is not being refreshed, this thing can solve it. <laughs> there is nothing that this cannot solve. We are fine with that. Some of us, we can even enjoy that one. If the guy is funny, if the guy is engaging, some of us can even, ah, do this guy is describing, everybody's not buying the bus you want to buy. Then we are fine with that. But then after that guy now sits down, JJ, you say, ah, let me, and that guy will not stand again. Praise the Lord! If you know you want to get home, if you know it's God that has been keeping you from January up to December, you will listen to the sound of my voice. <laughs> and then he just be there and say, oh my word. And it goes on and on. He'll tell you about hell, tell you about judgment, tell you about most, tell you all kinds of stuff. <clears throat> yes, most of them, many of them preach false gospel. Yes. Many of them emphasize hell and judgment so much, which is not always bad. But if all we do is to criticize them, if the first reaction that we have every time, if the sustaining reaction that we have towards them is disdain, it is, what again, what is, he, what is he saying? And if that is all we do, just react, and don't go ahead to proclaim, to leave out the gospel, what does he say about us? Are we not ashamed of the gospel? You see, courageous followers may not employ those means of proclaiming, of living out the gospel. Yes, they may not, because they, may, they, are, they, are, they are mostly not effective in this time or age. They are not contextualizing, or they don't fit our singing or the kinds of people that we have today. Yes. But you see what courageous followers will do? Courageous followers would let others know, like their friends, their colleagues, their neighbors, they would let them know of their Christian faith by mentioning they are just slotting inside the conversation about their church attendance, by slotting in their Christian beliefs in conversations. Is the courageous followers will say, mm, Pastor preaches from the pulpit. I cannot preach. I don't even lead GC. Oh, but my children, oh, you will get the resource to catechize them, to get, help them memorize scripture, help them understand what is going on in this story here. Oh, this story of David and Goliath is not just about you, it's about Christ. They teach them from young. Courageous followers. Courageous followers would, would confront that, that struggling, ambitious lawyer at work, or that struggling musician or artist friend who is struggling with identity and self expression. I would say, see, I've, and you just come and say, you say, I know the way out for this. I know something that can help you. I've been through this myself. You see, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus went through for me. I, I don't, you don't have to, you know, this is what he did in my life. They don't share their story. This is what courageous philosophers They're not ashamed of the gospel. They listen and ask questions about the beliefs of others. They listen and appreciate. They listen to understand, to care for them. They share their lives first with people. And then share the gospel with them. They invite them to LQC. They invite them to places where they can meet other believers like Milan Fonde. They invite them to marry the Lagos. Courageous followers. Just like pastor is doing, just like Jesus leader is doing, I will do, I will not be ashamed of the gospel. You see, when you do this, sometimes God will have mercy on you and people will listen and you see change lives and you see people come to the faith. But other times, people will ignore you they will say, don't destroy hey, You are not even saying that. You want to say, ah, eh, or God said that we should look at the, this assignment. You say, hey, you have come again. No, no, I'm not talking about, the, I'm not talking about Jesus. They will disturb you. They will mock you on Twitter. Some of us will even lose contracts because of this. Because you always want to bring your faith. I can't take, but I can't do that. You lose contracts. You lose deals. They will be there's all these people that are anti-gay. All these ones that that are anti-science. They're not, they're not forward or progressive. They will not allow women to be leaders, elders in their churches. These anti-women people, anti-progress of the country. They say, don't, don't believe your leaders. They can't solve a problem. They don't even want movement. But that's everything church. You pray, pray, pray. The children may not even respond well to your teaching and to your bringing up. You see, but when you begin to see this in your life, you see what you're doing. You are joining with your leaders in your suffering. You are feeling the pain of rejection as they do. You are feeling their suffering. You are, you are experiencing what it means for them. In your own little way, in your own small way as a follower. This is what courageous followers do. And so we get to the point and say, okay, mm, refresh. And I shame each two, <laughs> but that's too. He's like 10, it's much. How can I do it? Look at verse 16. I want us to look at verse 16. 
Verse 16 says, I said it before, he said, May the Lord grant mercy to the household of a nursery for us, to one day. In verse 18, it says that, you see, may the Lord, may the, may, may the Lord grant that one day will find mercy to stand in that day. Mercy. You see, this is how, how, how do courageous fellows find the courage, the strength to refresh their leaders, to not be ashamed of their chains through the mercy of the Lord. You see, this mess is sufficient. It's sufficient from now, while you're struggling. It's sufficient tomorrow or this week when you try, and then next week you fall and you can't do what you're supposed to do. You're not refreshing. You forget to be. You forget to do what you're supposed to do. So you say it's sufficient from now till the last day. And that's it. So Makanaki came. So Makanaki came to the door and he left. He had the place. He had set the place on fire. All in fire, flames, fumes everywhere. We already believe that she's going to die. And then one guy, so this is one of the good apples in the police. So this guy found um, the person who had given her away, people who had ensured that um, she would die, like at all costs. Found the guy, and then he made the guy reveal the secret, and then he, he ran. This guy, at some point earlier in the movie, this was the guy that um, Shalashi had kind of deceived. You know, didn't give, her, give him the information that he needed, but this guy went, saying, no, this woman will not die. Like, so when he got there, he was in flames, flames, how is this guy going to get in? How is he going to get in? How is he going to get in? He was able to get one of his boys that went came with him, and then he got a ladder. He set it against the wall of the house. He climbed to the top, and then he went in through the top window. He got in the fumes and the flames, coughing, and just struggling. He went in, and he found um, Shalom, he said, come out. She said, no, leave me. I want to stay. Let me die. Let me die. I don't have any hope outside. Let me suffer alone. Don't come here. And the girl would not allow her. He dragged her, pulled her, and then struggled out, coughing, fuming, you know, partaking in the smoke and the flame, the suffering together. Then he, he took her out. See, this guy was not meant to do this because earlier, see, the guy wouldn't have taken the bribe that they offered him to $500K, his wife. His wife was ailing. His wife was going to die, but he rejected the bribe. He rejected the 500K. And then he did this, he brought her out. They merrily escaped and he sent Shola Sholobawali off, free to start off newly as if nothing happened. And while during his escape, his own wife died. He was crying and he was letting Shola Bawali go. He could not be at his, at his wife's hospital, at the, at the hospital with his wife while she was dying and he was setting Shola Sholobawali free. Now who does this remind us of? You see, Jesus, because the meaning of mercy here is to see someone suffering, to see someone's pain, and to say, no, I will share with them. I will go into them. I will feel so much compassion, and I will not let it go. I want to partake of their suffering in order to bring them out. So Jesus saw our suffering. He was moved with compassion. He brought help to us. He came in. While we are consumed with our, in, our, in our own challenge, or consumed in our sin, consumed in death, he came in to refresh us. When we were incapable of rescuing ourselves, he came to help us. May the Lord grant us mercy. May the Lord grant that we'll find mercy on the last day. This is how we get the courage to refresh our leaders. This is how we get the courage to not be ashamed of their chains. Last week, I said that, see, our leaders watch over our souls. Why? Why do they want us to obey them? Why do they want us to obey? Because they watch over our souls. And not just that, because they will give an account. You see, not just leaders will give accounts. When Paul says here that, they will find, that he will find mercy on the last day, he's also talking about the day of judgment. When he's talking about the day, he's talking about the day of judgment. You see, followers, courageous followers. You see, guys, friends, we're going to give accounts of how we served our leaders. The last day. This is how we find mercy. See what he says. He says, Jesus said this. He said, you will come. And Jesus will ask us. He's going to ask you to give a kind. He say, um, you see, you did not. When I was in prison, you didn't take care of me. When I was hungry, you didn't bring me food. When I was thirsty, you didn't bring me drink. When I was alone, the spirit that discouraged nobody, everyone deserted me. Every GC member, every church leader deserted me. No one came around me. And you didn't do anything to me. He said, Lord, when did I see you? He said, when you did not do it to your leader, when you did not do it to that GC leader, you've not done it to me. How would it be if the Lord says to you, when I was in prison, you came to meet me. When I was hungry, you brought food to me. When I was thirsty, you brought me drink. Can this be our testimony? May the Lord grant us mercy.